they are kind of basically that's a flat line there so essentially we could say mindfulness is neutralizing the effect of the covid stressor that's coming at you okay and that's the that's great right like i i i don't think we could expect anything better if i had found something like mindfulness is dramatically making people sleep better uh, that would that would you know I, I, that would be too great to be true uh, but it's neutralizing the effect of the stress right so that's the uh, the first study so we wanted to replicate replicate this uh, study because it's just uh, it happened uh, uh, you know with an intervention but the, in the next study we recruited a sample of 140 working adults all of whom were uh, uh, working remotely and we uh, measured their mindfulness daily so rather than doing an intervention because um, you know uh, it, it's very hard to do intervention studies the fact that my co-author uh, got uh, got us to do this in china in the time that she did was remarkable but we wanted to replicate our results so rather than do an intervention we measured mindfulness daily and these are people that reported that they were actively working remotely they were still taking zoom calls every day they were working virtually many of them were healthcare but they were in administrative positions in healthcare and this was a study that was conducted in june 2020 um for 10 consecutive working days so we started on a monday to friday and week to monday to friday so we had all of these measures on a daily basis so here uh, we actually uh, measured covid-19 stress um not objectively but subjectively right so they were asked the question today at work how often did covid-19 interfere, interfere with your job right like so how much did those thoughts affect you and there was a daily mindfulness state measure we had the sleep uh, same sleep quantity measure and we also have another measure on vitality at work how engaged you are at work uh, today I, at work i felt bursting with energy is one measure one sample item of the work engagement scale and what we found is i without going into the uh, psychometric uh, the econometrics of this and uh, just showing you the uh, the results because you know uh, many of you may not be uh, so interested in the numbers but if you are please get in touch i am more than happy to engage with you so we replicate the exact same result so we find that mindfulness actually neutralizes the effect of covid-19 stress on sleep quantity and in addition we also find that sleep quantity actually predicts daily work engagement so essentially mindfulness is leading to better work engagement even during times of covid stress by actually improving your sleep hygiene right so that's essentially um, two studies that show the exact same results with two very different samples um now uh, these are some contributions to the literature so mindfulness can be an effective intervention that can help employees cope uh, with the stress of covid-19 like you know our two earlier speakers have already talked about um and they're already doing that they didn't actually have to wait for this uh, research to come out they know this they're doing this but this is for you know dissemination to the larger community of organizations i think healthcare are, uh, organizations are early adopters to mindfulness um some of the other organizations i speak to um are only now beginning to uh, wake up to the to the uh, benefits of mindfulness at the workplace uh it impacts uh, sleep quantity and affects downstream engagement uh, work engagement and it's evidence based so this is important right like for us to you know many of you in this conference you may already uh, you you probably here because you already recognize the power and the value of mindfulness Uh, but for the larger community out there it's important for us to generate evidence and really like you know i've done this like a scientist without any preconceived biases it's done really to examine whether this can be a beneficial in in intervention and it, it it is it is so we have the data now to show that um so now what are we planning we're planning uh, some uh, additional studies so we have now two more studies that where we actually tease out the importance of mindful awareness and mindful attention so if you look at the literature on mindfulness there are really two components there's the awareness component there's the attention component uh, uh sorry it's not attention it's acceptance actually sorry about the typo there it's mindful awareness and mindful acceptance and we now show actually those two have different effects so awareness is important in regulation whereas acceptance in, is 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 important in reactivity so so we kind of tease apart the effect of mindfulness so this is you know what scientists like to do you know you have an effect you want to kind of really tease out what those effects are and why are you building these effects so that we've done in two additional studies and uh, uh, we are now in the process of planning a large scale intervention study 
this is in the UK with a collaborator in the UK uh, with uh, sleep monitoring and biomarkers as well uh, to look at like cortisol response, those sorts of things uh, to really look at whether uh, in, in these times, actually we're doing the planning the study as we speak, uh, whether mindfulness interventions can actually be beneficial. Uh, another, um, uh, I actually added this point as I was listening to Nicholas speak, uh, um, because uh, one of the things we are trying to do here, uh, one, a project that we're looking at, and this is very much early stage, so if any of you uh, feel moved by this or want to study this, please feel free to get in touch. So there is a lot of talk about post-traumatic stress, right? Like, so we know PTSD is, uh, is, 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 is studied heavily, but what's not studied so much is post-traumatic growth, right? So uh, like Nicholas was sharing there, the, the people that he was speaking to at uh, the CCF, uh, they were saying, this is an opportunity for me to grow. You know, this is, uh, I find meaning and purpose in doing what I do. Now, how can we get people there, right? Like, so how can mindfulness be a tool that when people look back at this pandemic, they say, you know what, that, that was as bad as it was, as traumatic as it was, I became the person I am because of that trauma that I went through. And we know that, you know, from the literature on the crucibles of leadership, that trauma actually does predict, like, you know, not, not all trauma is good, but trauma is essentially something that makes you grow, that make that you, you, you be, the caterpillar becomes the butterfly because there is a trauma. So the trauma is really the churning of the metal to create the, to, to churning of the carbon to create the diamond, if I may using the metaphor, right? So, so can mindfulness actually be a tool which allows for this post-traumatic growth after the pandemic rather than kind of people uh, moving into post-traumatic stress? So this is something that we need to look at. So, and I also think there is tremendous opportunities to do more collective practice. I think there is something about mindfulness that is very powerful when it is done in collectives. And that's the reason I'm, I'm so passionate about doing this in an organizational context. Because I can, of course, download a Headspace or a, or a Calm or, or whatever it is that I do and just put, go on my phone and, and, and practice mindfulness. But there is something about coming together as a group and practicing collectively. And organizations offer a ready-made collective uh, group where you can actually engage in this practice. And that might actually help people uh, cope not just with uh, the organizational aspects, but also their personal lives. Because if they are gainfully engaged, employed, and the organization supports their journey of inner growth that may that will rub off on their family that will rub on off on their ex, on their extended community so i really think organizations here in in these times can be a force for good for society and if all, if all organizations do what uh, nicholas and uh, prof cheng have, have shared do i think we can actually create a better world uh, because of this pandemic because we support people's growth we support people's development and as a result, we create a better society. Anyway, this is kind of utopian thoughts, um, and I, I, I'm allowed to have them uh, as an ivory tower academic somewhat. So um, some acknowledgments here. So these are all uh, folks that have worked with me as PhD students, but they've all gone on to do different things in different places. So Michelle uh, was uh, uh, you know, my collaborator on the Wuhan project. She, was, she collected all of the data. Uh, Theo is at SMU uh, here in Singapore. Jingshan is a former PhD student who is uh, going to take up a job in Catholica in Lisbon if he gets his visas. Um, uh, Izen is a, is a PhD student at NUS and Noriko is a former PhD student at NUS who is now a postdoc at SMU. And thanks to MOE for uh, you know, supporting this, uh, this work, uh, especially the second study. Um, you know, I, I, I got funding in like a matter of days uh, when this uh, pandemic was uh, beginning in February because there was some emergency funding available. I'm very grateful for that support. Um, please get in touch with me. That's my uh, coordinates, uh, Twitter or email, and I'm more than happy to take any questions.